Thanks for coming. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. It's always good to speak out a subject that I really enjoy talking about, which is obviously gas and LNG, and speak to a, a group like yourselves who I think really need to understand this business from a kind of a unique perspective. I mean, if I understand correctly, a lot of you guys evaluate companies that are in this space. You make recommendations of buying and selling these companies. And I think oftentimes we, the knowledge of very specific projects comes from the company. I think we'll take that with a grain of salt because the company says the project is good. Is it really that good? We don't know that. And you know what's amazing thing about these LNG projects, as we know in Australia, the, the quantum of capex investment is so, so big that you just can't afford to get it wrong. You know, you, you recommend a company such as Santos, and I'm gonna name names here today, so, you know, I can do that. Uh, I work for myself, I can do what I want, I guess. So, um, you know, you, a company like Santos, so much of their future uh, revenues and so much of their current CapEx spend is on these projects. So you better, you know, try to really understand these projects if you want to understand the company. And I think that's where the disconnect comes. So what I've tried to create here today is a way for us to actually rate these projects in a very neutral, very as objective manner as possible. And the idea basically is, you know, uh, last week I was traveling to Hong Kong and if I look on some of these travel websites and I say, oh, I want to stay in a three-star hotel or four-star hotel, yes, I can choose the brand name hotels and I know what I to expect. If I stay at a Hyde, I know what I'm getting, a Sheraton, I know what I'm getting. But if I'm staying at the, you know, the Wan Chai Inn, I don't know if it's a one-star hotel or a three-star hotel. So I rely on some kind of a system to say, oh, it's a three-star hotel. And in my mind, I know what I'm getting for a three-star hotel. So what I'm trying to do is a star system for the LNG projects in some ways. Because, you know, after all, the knowledge that we get is from the companies themselves. But if I say that's a three-star project versus a five-star project, it's obviously a five-star project or something better going for it than a three-star project. And that's what we're going to try to understand today. Uh, very casual presentation. Please interrupt. Please ask me questions. Please debate. Um, you know, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, you heard all about me. I kind of run my own little consultancy firm, and I'm, I guess one of my faults is I tend to be very outspoken in what I think. So that brings me to my disclaimer. These are my opinions. <laughs> and, you know, you do with it what you want, and that's great. Uh, but just, you know, if something goes wrong, tough. And buyer beware, as I say. So, uh, and please, if, if you think something is not correct, if it's not factually correct, please correct me, and I'm more than happy to, to make those changes. All right, so I'll start off in the way, that this, you know, kind of the gist of it, that not all projects are the same. You know, we really cannot assume all projects are the same. Uh, I'm going to rate some projects, I'll rate all the Australian projects today, and I'll say that some projects are really good. They have all the characteristics, in my mind, of makes a project. And I can say that because I think I've been around long enough to see what makes it, but others are really not that good. Uh, you know, we talk about Browse, we talk about Aero, we talk about GLNG, we talk about Fishing Landing. Now, you know, these are all have been in the news the last few weeks, but I did this presentation six months ago, and I named these exact projects then, well before they were in the news, as being problem childs, if I can say that. And so I think what this has proved to me is that this is a bit of a leading indicator of projects that I think are going to, are heading towards a bit of a crash. And so can we use this to say, listen, let's identify the strong ones, let's identify the weak ones, and then decide how we can improve the weak scores. We can improve the scores, that's very important. Or the, score, the weak ones, we should just let them kind of die out as they do. So this is really designed, the idea is more designed not from the project sponsor company, the guys who actually put the projects together, it's designed from the buyer's point of view. If I'm sitting as a power utility in India, or in China, or in Thailand, and I am being bombarded by all these people coming and trying to sell me LNG, asking me to sign long-term contracts, do I really have the knowledge, information, wherewithal to understand which project I should be betting on? If I was an Indian buyer who bet on the browse as a James Price Point onshore-based project with that much volume, et cetera, et cetera, and then two years later, Woodside pulls the plug on it, have I, am I in big trouble? I expected that gas to show up X years from now. Am I too late for other gas? What am I going to do? You know, so this actually is something that they should look at. And I think oftentimes that's not what happens at all. I've been on the other side of the table, and you get all these companies parading through. You know, Shell walks in with their nice suits on, and they give you all these nice little Shell pen thingies. And in the end, they say, look, I have 10 projects around the world, and all these projects have stamp of Shell on them, so they all are good. You know, so it doesn't matter which one you buy from. 
sign a gas deal, which, which, when do you want your gas? So you want it in 2018? This is the project coming online, then sign up for this. Well, not all shell projects are the same. Not all other projects are the same. So that's what this is all about. But I digress. So, uh, so I think importantly, my, I identified some of these weak projects, and I think today we'll try to identify the next round of weak projects, potentially, and try to explain why I come up with these things. So investors, governments, and government regulators should beware. And I think that's what I'm really, is my new thing I'm getting on, is I think the Australian government has totally failed us. And I actually wrote a blog about this, and I have some copies of the blog, which I'm happy to let you read, or you can go to my website and read it. But the government did not do a, at all a good job in the last few years, because the government became a cheerleader instead of a regulator. It was got so enamored with, oh my God, look at all this tax revenue we're going to get, and all these jobs that are promised, that we should get everybody to do all these projects all together. And I think in hindsight, that was completely a wrong thing for the government to do. And it's not the role of the government. The government should have said, oh, look, let's look at which projects are better than others. Let's try to figure out which ones we should develop first and then go from there. And that's what the governments in Qatar has done. That's why they are very successful. The government in Norway very much, uh, you know, they give you a cue of where the development should be. They have that bit of intervention, which I think is really important here. We got all excited. And look, we have a situation today in Gladstone, you know, in Curtis Island, which is a dinky little island just off Gladstone. You have three projects that are massively competing for the same resources with absolutely no cooperation between them. Compare that to Ras Lafan in Qatar, which I spent a lot of time in, where you have you know, eight projects producing 77 million tons, but they all share the same jetty. They all share the same tank farm. They all share the same power plant. They all share the same utilities. And the same labor has moved from one project to the other, even the first project is Conical, next project is Shell, next project is Exxon. The government put them in a line and said, this is how things are going to be. And it's all been very successful, and the projects didn't have the big blowouts that we see here today. So that's what we're trying to get at. So I think the government should be aware, and maybe the government should have used a tool like this. The next thing I'm going to really get into is <coughs> FID. You know, we get so, and maybe this is a financial thing, and you know, FID is like, oh, the end of, end of everything. FID, let's pop the champagne, it's all, it's all over, it's all going to be good. And I think FID is just the beginning of your troubles, is actually what it is, you know. And I think we get, we, we put too much towards FID. FID, for those you know, is final investment decision. And that's a, that's a point where, theoretically, the sponsor companies, the buyers, the regulators, the permits, everything is there, and now you're moving ahead. And that's a really important milestone, don't get me wrong. But FID does not mean the project is going to be successful at the end of the day. You know, I think that's the difference. Uh, are all projects in your company's portfolio equal quality? No. And I think Australian projects really are not scoring that high. So let's just get into that. So why can I say this? Well, I'm neutral. I think no, very few people, if I work for any other company, I couldn't say this. Uh, and I think I had the right background, hopefully some of my education credentials, but that's all just pieces of paper. I think I've been around the block a lot. I've worked in many different countries places, different types of companies, and you know, I think I've seen what, what happens. And I've been on both sides. I've bought LNG and I've tried to sell LNG. So I've uh, seen lots of projects. Some are good and some are not good. And I've done an objective analysis. So let's get into it. So there's some 50 projects around the world, at least. And I have um, a new app that I've just done up, which has 85 projects around the world on it. It lists all the projects. We'll talk about that later. But there's about 50 projects around the world that are being proposed at any given point. So there's a lot of interest in LNG. LNG is in the news every day. They cannot pick up a paper every day without LNG in the news. Some of these projects are obviously post-FID. That means they are under construction. Money is being thrown at them. Things are moving ahead. Some, of course, are operational. I don't discuss those. Uh, and some are pre-FID, which is really where I think the most interest comes in. Because while these projects are being proposed, should the, should the companies be valued for those projects or not? That's what you guys struggle with, I'm sure. And at what stage do you value them? And I think that our temptation is FID happens, boom, it's real. Let's stick it in the cash flow. Let's stick it in the revenue stream. It's all good. And I'm saying, well, hold on a minute. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we can't compare because the project companies wants, uh, can, can promote their own projects. And they promote all the projects to be equal. I mentioned that uh, an example of a shell. That's so, so true. Because one of the things that the companies offer to the buyers is saying, hey, don't worry about the individual project risk. Buy from shell. Yes, we'll write on a piece of paper Pelu, but if Pelu doesn't happen in time, we'll, my, we'll make up for your gas with something else. We'll have so many projects in our portfolio. It sounds like a good idea, but you pay for that option. You know, the buyers pay a great deal for that option. But at the end of the day, they're still committed to that first project. And if the first project slips, 
they can all be in trouble. And now Shell has to basically say, oh, yes, okay, I'll get you some other gas, but it's going to cost you more. It's a different term. It's whatever the case might be. So be careful. And so here's my universally accepted system. So what I've done, and this is not rocket science. I'll start off there. I'm not going to, you know, this is, it's, it's just trying to use a way to score all these things that influence a project. And I've broken these factors, these success factors, into four groups. Upstream factors, and upstream is really under the ground. What is the ground? You know, what does it look like? Are we looking at how much reserves is there? In, you know, in our day, in the old days, it was all about saying, you need to have 125% of the gas you need for the project you want before we move the project ahead. I mean, you have to have a 25% cushion, you know, to make sure the gas is there. And that was a system, a, a rule of thumb since day one you know, in this business. Well, three years ago, the Australian companies threw that completely out the window, and they said things like, how much contingency resources do you need? How much, you know, at the, you know, we have the 1P, 2P, 3P, different grades of reserves. Uh, one is prove, one's pro prove, probable, possible. And we started going further and further down that thing to say, to justifying our project. And if you remember in 2007, 2008, these projects in Gladstone started off as being one train, two trains, and four trains each. You know, and suddenly we kind of lost track of how big these things are. We were suddenly building three Qatars on an island in the middle of Queensland. You know, I mean, it was just not at all realistic. And so, it all, because there was no longer that reserve base to justify that size. Oh, the market wants more? We'll give them more. You know, thinking about, well, what are you giving them? You're giving them gas. You better make sure you have that damn gas. Otherwise, what are you giving them? So, reserve life, extremely important. Now, one thing that I have hopped on for years and years is the importance of NGLs. And let me just kind of backtrack and explain to all you financial wizards what NGLs are. NGLs are natural gas liquids. Natural gas liquids are really everything heavier than the methane molecule. Methane is C1, and that's what you liquefy into LNG. And that's what you use in your power plants, and that's what goes on a ship to Japan, and that's what goes into a CNG vehicle, etc., etc. But really, that's not the valuable stuff. The valuable stuff is the heavier molecule. The LPGs, the stuff that goes in your barbecue tank, you know, propane, butane, your ethanes, and your condensates. Because those things traditionally have prices that are linked to oil as opposed to prices that are not connected to oil. Methane is typically not connected to oil, of course, we'll talk a little bit of why that forced connection has happened, but typically the LPGs are really where the money is. And if you go back to the last 20 years of the Northwest Shelf Project, the amount of money they have made over LPGs is probably more than the money they have made on the methane sales itself. So the volume is much lesser, but much, much more valuable stuff. So if you have NGLs in your gas, which you have no control over, it's in the gas, so it's not in the gas, your project is that much further ahead. And ex an example of this is Qatar. Qatar, they are truly blessed, those guys, lucky guys. Um, they're sitting on a very, very large gas field, but it's also incredibly rich. And if you look at some of the analyst reports, Qatar can actually sell its LNG to Japan at zero price. It can give it for free because the NGLs give you that much extra revenue. They they get so much money out of the revenue, they can totally subsidize any methane. So you're competing against a gorilla in the room who can give the gas away for free. And you're competing on gas. Well, you'll say, well, I have NGLs too. Well, no, you don't have NGLs. That's a problem. Some projects in Australia have NGLs, and that happens to be in the Western Australia and the West. But all the projects that come out of the coal sea methane projects in Queensland, by its very nature, coal sea methane has no, it's methane. It is not, there's no liquids in it. It's just the way nature is. So those projects in Queensland, and you can see I'm really getting on those projects in Queensland because I really don't think that that's my big, big thing here. But those projects really did not have that benefit of the economics from the NGLs. So I give I give a different, a different score with the NGLs. And of course, CO2, you don't want CO2. It's a pollutant. So just, we have things like field access. How easy is it to get to the field? Do I have land access problems? You know, initially, I think that uh, the Queensland projects didn't expect to have so much land access problems. We are now showing that that problem is not going away. It actually seems to be getting worse and worse about land access, the lock, the gates, and all that kind of stuff. That's definitely an issue. The reservoir quality itself, how well does the reservoir produce? That's been another issue with those Queensland projects. They had these very uh, optimistic assumptions that the mm -hmm. gas is just going to flow like crazy. If you go back to the Santos' investor presentation for the last three years, it's really interesting to see how many wells they have had to drill 
to keep up trying to get the reserves that they want, and it's not looking really that good, which is why Santos, again, I get on Santos's case, but oh well, uh, they have to run around and uh, turn around and buy the gas from onshore uh, fields, from conventional fields in the Cooper, and from Origin and some of the other people. So now suddenly you're, instead of an LNG project being proposed to use uh, massive amounts of gas that we think we have, which is what the justification they did three years ago, if you remember the papers, is all about, we have so much gas, Queensland market is not there, we need to export an LNG. That was a big PR push. And now, just look back and say in the last 12 months, Santos has had to sign two agreements to buy gas from the Cooper and from Origin because they don't have enough of their own gas. So unfortunately, we as consumers in Melbourne have a higher gas price because they are now using the Cooper gas for export. And if they had started off three years ago and said, oh, we want to build an LNG project to export Cooper gas, the government would have said no way and it never would have happened. So it's kind of an interesting thing that, that I don't think the reserves are there. Distance to field to plant, if you've got to build a long pipeline, that hurts you. And you, of course, your upstream cost itself. How much does it cost to actually produce that gas? Then I'll look at above ground features. So, by the way, just to kind of put things in context, these are all the parameters that go into my index. And I give a score for every one of these things and I crunch them through a very simple model and I do some weightings and stuff and I come up with a scorecard and I rate the scorecard. So that's where we're going with all this. So, uh, But I'm just, the reason I'm spending a bit of time here, because I think these are the questions that you as CFA guys should be asking your companies. When the company manager comes through and says, I'm going to propose a project, say, so what's your NGL content in that gas? How much reserves do you have for that gas? That's a question you should ask. Because that's what, to me, determines if that LNG project is going to be successful or not. Not just that they have a buyer signed up in Korea. That's almost an easy part in some ways. Okay. Uh, so how much support is there for the government? You know, I think that's really an interesting thing because some projects get government support and some projects don't get government support. Around the world, it's a bit more of an issue, obviously. Um, I can argue that the ICTUS project, which is the big project that the Japanese are building from northwest, uh, from the northwest Carnarvon Basin, well, from, sorry, from the Browse Basin, the 800 kilometer pipeline is going to Northern Territory for many reasons. But they're willing to build an 800 kilometer pipeline, partly because they, want, they had more government support in Northern Territory than they had in WA. And in retrospect, it wasn't a bad decision because you see the project, other projects in WA being canceled. So, you know, that's a, an index on government support. Fiscal stability, a native rights, big issue. Obviously, native rights, which is, I think, the aboriginal issues at James Price Point, et cetera, that's what killed the Browse project in many ways. So, very, very important, easy to kind of undermine. Uh, environmental permits, we talked about that. Uh, fiscal stability, big issue. I think Australia seems to pat itself on the back thinking it has this great fiscal stability, but actually I don't think the fiscal stability here is very good at all. You know, every government seems to come along and propose different types of massaging of the same tax structure. I'm not saying they all go through, but it just adds an air of uncertainty. So I think I would give the U.S. projects a higher score for fiscal stability than the U.S. than Australian projects because Australian projects, I mean, you've seen history has shown that things aren't that stable here in terms of taxes to the uh, to the resource industry. You guys know more about this than I do. I'd say the same about the US, though. Uh, not for taxes. So they switched profits tax on Gulf of Mexico producers, et cetera. They've had it, but they have, that's been stable. They have known it all along. That's the difference. I don't, I'm not talking about the quantum of taxes. Mm -hmm. That's not the fiscal stability. It's what I'm trying to get at. And I think the US has been very, very careful about not changing the tax structure. I'm not saying it's right at low or high, it's just not changing it. But Australia, whether it changes or not, it talks about changing it. And that's what the stability issue is. If it, you know, as you guys know, it's all about having something that's certain. If you have something that's certain, you put it in your model, you're happy with it. What you don't want to put in your model is, well, this year it's 25%, next year it's 38%. Then you don't know what to do. So, but it's a good point. Uh, labor cost, obviously that's been a, a, an issue. And this is a bit of a, you know, this is where my, I think my model kind of falls apart a little bit because I think labor costs are high because too many projects have been approved, but if your labor costs were indexed, then maybe you won't have that many projects approved. It's kind of a vicious circle. But the fact is, labor cost and availability is an issue in Australia, and that's hurting the competitiveness of these projects. So that's your above ground. Then I get into technical, uh, similar kind of thing. I mean, your contractor that you've chosen for your project, how experienced are they? Do they know what they're doing? Uh, one of the things that I always still really wonder about is why all three projects in Gladstone chose the same lead contractor. Uh, as Bechtel. Now, maybe that's a smart move, maybe that's not a smart move, I don't know yet, but it's just really interesting that you're putting all your eggs in that one basket. If they have a problem with their welder unions, I'm just making that up, 
then everybody suffers equally. And I think that's not what I would have done, but that's what they've done. And, but I don't think I rate them down for that because Bechtel is a very competent contractor. So how much infrastructure is required? This is where I really get on the case because you know we have seen time and time again in LNG projects around the world, if you can piggyback off existing infrastructure, you take a massive element of CapEx risk away. You know, so a green field versus a brown field project, major difference. And here in Australia, we kind of went out of our way to make sure every project is a green field project. You know, instead of encouraging brown field projects, you know, instead of encouraging, if people can build a pipeline from, you know, a browse basin all the way to Darwin, then you sh we should have encouraged as many pipelines as you can to go into Karata. And every should, everybody should be piggybacking off the massive infrastructure that's already there and build you know, giant collective tank farms, collective jetties, you already have the systems in place, the labor is there, the town exists, et cetera, et cetera, instead of us building new towns in the middle of nowhere, which for some reason seemed like a government policy to do and actually just constrain the system. You know, in Gladstone, as I said again, you know, a, a friend of ours, uh, Lee and I said, I was, you know, friend, we were talking about who was up in, uh, recently he went on an on a, on a analyst investment bank visit to Gladstone, he made a comment which I thought was really interesting. He said to go from Gladstone to Curtis Island, which is just an island right in the harbor, each of the, sh of the three companies, which is BG's, AP, uh, QCLNG, GLNG from Santos, and Origins APLNG, each of the three companies runs their own little ferry to go across because they don't want to share the ferry even. So you can imagine that how much issues, it's just you get to from one, from the mainland to the island, they all had to take their own little ferry. Well, the ferries are coming, they all come to the same beach on the other side. It's only like a 20 minute drive, but they don't even want to share that. It's down to that much, you know, lack of infrastructure, lack of, sh lack of sharing at all. And I think the government is to blame. The government should said, no, okay, you guys want to build three projects together? You know, we'll build it in, you know, it's like the housing development. You know, in a, in a housing development, which is exactly what Qatar did. They provide the land, or they say, here's your land, that you may pay for it. But we give you the infrastructure, we give you the utilities, and you just put your house on this lot. And you don't have to build, you worry about where the power comes from, you'll get the power like everybody else. That's not what the government did. I think that was wrong. Okay. Uh, infrastructure required, engineering stage, and that's one thing that changes. Obviously, the project scores are not consistent, not constant, sorry. It changes as the project develops some more. So my engineering stage is really where I am today, where I need to go in a few years from now. So I give a score for that. I'm getting bogged down in details, I'll get, jump into this. So I talk about how experienced the operator is. Has the operator done this before? How many other projects have they built around the world? And then I talk a lot about buyer type. And buyer type, I think this is really important. Are you selling to someone who's going to resell the gas, LNG? Or are you buy, selling it to someone who's going to be the end user? Because I would argue if you're selling to an end user, he has a lot more vested interest to make sure your project happens on time, below, you know, on CapEx, et cetera, so things, like, things happen. But if you're selling it to a trading company, they're a bit more flexible. And I think GLNG's problem is so much of this output was being sold to Petronas, who happens to be one of the major investors as well, who was just going to try to resell the gas. So I think the checks and balances one there. If I'm selling it to a Tokyo Electric, they are much more likely to be calling me up and say, hey, is the gas going to happen? What's going on? What's going on with the project? I'm, I'm planning for this gas to show up. So the type of buyer you get, I think it influences your score here and the experience of the buyer and stuff. Okay, jump right here. So I give a score of all these factors, zero to three, and then I change it to a zero to 100 based on a weighting. And the weighting is because, you know, I think a lot of people can argue that, oh, you know, technical is not as important as commercial is not important as this, and you can actually change the weighting scores in my little model quite easily. What factors are more important for you? But I think at the end of the day, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. And then I put things in, into this index. I call it my Kerogen LNG Project Success Index little trademark, I don't know what that really means, but someone told me I better do that, so here we are. Uh, project groupings, and I find that the groupings are surprisingly <laughs> resilient to the weightings. And I try to base it on third party, but I'm happy to modify the scores. So what did I do? I looked at all these Australian projects. I looked at all the ones in the Northwest. I looked at Sunrise, which is both the one that's in uh, as a Timor, East Timor, Timor Less solution, as well as a, a FLNG solution, a floating LNG solution. I looked at browse, both as a land and a floating LNG, which is the discussion that we're having now. I looked at all the Queensland projects, I looked at the PNG projects, and I think this is important. Most of these projects have already reached FID. Only a few of them haven't reached FID, but that doesn't mean to me that they're going to be good projects. And that's what I think, I keep on harping on that. Uh, I think it's irrelevant, really. And the question, really, I ask myself, and you know, I've always been poo-poo when I ask this, is 
does our industry have the ability to stop a project if it, the economics get out of hand? You know, we in, if you go back to the Asian financial crisis 10 years ago, you know, Bangkok and Jakarta were surrounded by all these shells of buildings that just stopped because they ran out of money or the projects were no longer economic. I have never heard of an LNG project that stopped investing. And maybe they should because at some point, you're throwing good money after bad, but it's that whole concept that we love, and I'm sure you guys have propagated, is a sunk cost. Oh, it's a sunk cost. It doesn't matter. We're looking forward. The forward-looking economics look good. But at some point, have you not destroyed shareholder value? You know, because it's just, oh, okay, I've already spent so much, it's too late. I'm just going to keep on spending like a, like a, you know, like that drunkard in the bar. Oh, I've already bought so many people drinks, I might buy everybody else drinks too while I'm here. You know, that's exactly what I think we do because... Some of these projects, I actually think we should put the brakes on them. GLNG, you should put the brakes on. You don't have the gas. Your project costs are getting out of hand. The partners don't like it. Why are you spending money? Just stop it. Put it in a freeze situation and come back to it when the labor comes off some of the other projects. I don't know. It's never going to happen, and I'll be shot for saying that, but it's just you're destroying shareholder value by thinking it's a race you have to keep on winning. I have to keep on racing in, and I don't think we can be able to stop, and maybe they should. And then I just for fun, I put a few international projects in there because I really think that we tend to be myopic in our view a little bit here. Or, you know, we have the, we're going to be the world's size expert of LNG. The market wants us. They're clamming all over it. They're going to say it. But do we live in a very competitive world. In the last two years, the competition from East Africa, the competition from the U.S., the competition from Canada, it's all very real. So how does it all really fit into the big picture? And if you listen to David Knox, who's a friend, I've known David for many, many years, uh, you know, his presentation is always, uh, he's Santos CEO, he's always said, the competition in the U.S. is not going to affect us at all. Why? Because it's not going to be that much volume. Uh, I don't believe that. And we got them locked in the long-term contracts. And then I, in my blog, which I encourage you all to read, I said a long-term contract to me is like a bad marriage. And I know all about bad marriages, so we won't go there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but truly, uh, you cannot rely on a contract to keep a long-term 20-year relationship going which is what the Australian projects always get on. Every time I tell someone, you know, these projects are getting uncompetitive, they cannot compete, the answer is always, we have a long-term contract, don't worry about it. Well, I think if you have a long-term contract and that's all you're relying on, then I think you have a problem because they're going to look for ways to get out of the contract, they look for breaking the contract, and it's very, very hard to justify paying so much more for gas when your competition is paying that much less. And a buyer, everybody's going to try to weasel away out of these things. But... And they are pricey openers as well. Exactly. And the price reopener is a great thing. And I think that's something a price reopener is in most of the modern long uh, LNG contracts have put in there that every five years they have the rights to open them up. But if you listen to Santos, David Knox and others, they totally poo poo any impact of price reopener. Now, I don't have privy to the contracts, so I don't know what the price reopeners actually say. And my people will tell me that they don't actually give you that much latitude. But having said that, once you sit down and then have an opener, what gets discussed and what doesn't get discussed, I don't know. But look, I'm not saying the products are uneconomic. I'm just thinking that you better have more than just a, a long-term contract to keep your customer happy. You better give him value for money. And maybe they will, maybe they won't. But at some point, I think GLNG, for example, is getting so out of hand, and the bad news is only going to come out the next six months. Just every time you read about GLNG, just think about me. Uh, at some point, they should start to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this investment right now. Maybe we should do something else. And GLG is not the only one, I'll await some of the others as well. So I compared them to some of the other projects. And I'm going to try to update these scores periodically as well, and they should be on my site. So, yes? Another thing they say is that the uh, contracts, there's no advantage to the um, long, uh, those contracts have been sort of ripped up. Yeah. Um, the counterparties, you know, I agree. haven't been yep. counterparties for a long time, but... Okay, so my answer to that is the LNG world has gone through so much dramatic changes in the last few years that the world that we had before is not the world that we have now. I mean, truly, this time things are truly different. Why? Because we have this, there's about six main factors, and I'll try to name as many as I can. Number one is we have a lot more buyers in the market. You know, we used to have, you know, the Japanese, all kind of collectively bunched. Now we have nearly every country in Asia that has a, a shorefront, a waterfront, is thinking of building an LNG terminal. So we have a lot more buyers in the market. We have a lot more t of this new type of intermediary organization called the aggregator who are buying and selling. They're almost like trading companies now. So these guys have the ability to 
to go in very opportunistically where they need to be. So, it, in other words, what I'm, I'm arguing is that the long-term sanctity is no longer that important anymore. People are more willing to rip up these long-term contracts because they have options. I mean, look at this great example. It's not great, of course, the tragic example of the Japanese quake. The Japanese quake happened 2011, and, you know, there was, I think correctly so at the time, many predictions that this is going to be, oh my God, what is Japan going to do? Well, at the end of the day, the light stayed on, more or less. The prices didn't spike out of control, and the world's LNG market proved so robust that it could react to the short-term supply shortage very easily. And everything kind of worked out. Now, of course, it was coincidental. At the same time, that happened. Spain was collapsing, so they could divert cargoes. A lot of things happened. But the point is, the LNG commodity is becoming like other commodities. And there's people who can move and sell a lot more flexibility. So when you have flexibility, you know, why should I have, if I have flexibility and I just prove that Japan can double its LNG import and still manage to get the gas, why should I sign a 20-year marriage with you? You know, I don't know what's going to happen. Ten years ago, I had no choice. If I wanted to get the gas, you're the only ones, I needed that, all that kind of stuff. And third thing is we're seeing is a lot of these older projects, the legacy projects, are all obviously still making massive sums of money. The Northwest Shelf is a great example. And they have now more than paid off their debt and their capital. And so they are no longer that fussed about signing long-term deals. The Indonesian I've given me the Northwest Shelf. Of course, we all would like long-term deals. But the fact is, your justification for the long-term deal the first time was, oh, I'm a project in Indonesia. I can't get a credit. So Mr. Japan, Japanese buyer, sign a 20-year deal so on the back of your credit, I can get a project built. Made complete sense in the 70s when, you know, but once a project has now paid off his capital, you can't go to the Japanese in the year 2000 and use that same story because they're like, no, you're not building any more CapEx. The CapEx is done. You just want to, you know, you know tie, get me contracted for 20 years. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to. I want more openness. I want more flexibility in the contract. So, I have time. I didn't say that. You said they're uncontested. They can be. They can be uncontested. Yes. So let me let me else? let me try to uh, make sure I. Uh, yeah. Go on. Is that something else? These older developments that are now rolling on, yep. um, having paid back their capital mm -hmm. and debt, or Qatar selling low cost gas in the Asian market, actually are subsidising the NGOs. NGOs. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that this is, you know, I, uh, it, remains to, it remains to be seen what the market will be in the year 2017 when these projects are there trying to sell gas. But I do know for a fact is that right now, these Australian projects, which I think have low scores, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, I'll show the scores in a minute, are at the very, very high end of the price curve. And in a, if you are at the high end of a price curve, and there's no debate about that, if you're in the high end of the price curve, do you want to be there when it's a competitive market, or you want to be in the medium of the price curve, or you want to be in the low end of the price curve? These guys are going to be at the high end no matter what. Now, whether they're uncompetitive or not, it depends on a thousand factors that I don't know. You know, supply, demand, robustness, etc. But I do know that the U.S. is going to be able to sell gas at a lot cheaper price in today's U.S. prices. Whether that's sustainable long term, it's hard to know. I do know that there's a lot of gas being found in East Africa, and I do know that people are now encouraged to say, the Australian prices are the very top end. Can we beat that to get into the market? So, you know, I think if GLNG keeps on spending money and every six months announces the CapEx overrun, at some point, something is going to give. You know, when they announce that they're going to buy gas from the Cooper at $7, I really struggle how they can sell it to Asia less than 13 And that's the price everybody says. It's not anything. But 13 to me, is getting kind of crazy. You know, when I know that Northwest Shelf can probably break even at 5 or 7 so, now, they wouldn't sell it at 5 or 7, they're going to sell it at 12 and a half, but, you know, at this point, GLNG is just relying on its sanctity of its long-term contracts to keep shareholders and analysts like you happy, you know? And on a high oil price. And on a high oil price, because it's whole link to oil prices, but I don't want to get into that, because I'm a, I'll get on that for hours, but I believe the whole link to oil prices is crap and shouldn't have happened in the first place, and it's all going away, but that's heresy, because David Knox will say oil prices link is here to stay, so... Okay, let's get back to the subject of hand, is how I actually do this thing. So this is an example of, out of 30, this is just four of them, and I kind of simplified it here. I said reserves, are they less than 25%, 50 75%, or greater than 75%, I give you a score. The higher the number, the better it is. 
Sabine Pass is in the US, it's on the US grid, unlimited reserves. So I give them the highest score. Prelude, I know they have a bit of reserve problem, they're trying to get gas from trucks and other places, so lower score. NGLs, Sabine Pass is on the US grid, it's dry, there's no NGLs. Prelude, which is a shell project, has rich gas, so I give them a high score. Labor, uh, Prelude is lucky because it's going to build the whole thing as an FLNG in Korea. So for, for me, that makes not a labor a perfect thing that goes away, which is what now Woodside is looking at, other people are looking at. And the US has no labor issues. If I was doing it for, G, for the Gladstone projects, I would give them a really low score for labor. Technology, Prelude has a big problem. It's not a problem, but Prelude has a lot of technology that they need to develop for this project. It's big, it's offshore, it's FLNG, there's motion issues, there's offloading issues, etc. etc. A lot of new technology. Sabine Pass is off the shelf. The guy will come and build it. There's nothing new in it at all. Price per ton, Alfred experience. Sabine Pass has never done this before, Chenier. So Shell has done many, many of them. So you kind of think, in the end of the day, with all this and the 40 or 35 other scores, I give a score of Prelude of 79 and Sabine Pass of 83. Sabine Pass is a better project in my eyes than Prelude. Okay, so that's an example. So here I'm actually giving all the Australian scores of my little my, my spreadsheet itself. And you can see that this is actually ranked, names are named. Wheatstone, I think, is the best project in Australia for various reasons. You can see it gets great for upstream. Chevron knows what it's doing. Technical is pretty straightforward. So, okay, so these are three, uh, sorry. This is when I equally weigh the four factors. So I just take an arithmetic average. And these are when I weigh them differently. Upstream is more important than technical, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of numbers here, but the equal weight numbers is where I rank these things. So the bottom is Fisherman's Landing, which is a LNG Limited. Arrow, the news today was Arrow might be shelled or, or combined, so I was really happy to read that, but that was, this was six months ago I had this identified. Gulf, which is the inter-oil project in Papua, I don't know much about it. Sunrise as a Timor Less project, I can see why it causes problems. GLNG, which is what we talked about, Santos, Browse Land, you can see why it was canceled, it's at the very bottom. Sunrise FLNG is still not great, there's a lot of issues there. APLNG is the, after GLNG, that's the weaker one. Ictus is not so bad, then you get better and better. Gorgon is okay, still big, it's hard to know what happened to the cost. QCLNG, PNG, Perlion, and Wheatstone. So, this has a lot, of, a lot of colors on it, but basically this is the different weightings. So a score with different weightings, but you can see that in the end of the day, when I change the weightings around, the groups are pretty much set. They all kind of bunch, there's no aberration. So if you simplify this and just say, here's my av equal weighting, with the equal weighting, here's my blue are the Australian projects. And you can see the ones that are very much at the bottom and the ones that I think are okay. So these are the ones that I think the second tier kind of, uh, and it would be great to do this by company because I'll see the Woodside then ranks way back because all the Woodside ones are not so good. You know, if the project is operating, I don't put it in this. Pluto, I don't put it in this because there's no point. It's already reached the point. They can't fix anything. If there's any problem. It's already, it's already happening. But anything before operating, I think there's still a, still some kind of option. So that's what this is all about. And then I put these international projects in. This is why the U.S. is so good. You put in any U.S. project, it ranks incredibly high. If I was Australia, I'd be really worried because these projects definitely can be cheaper than Australian projects delivered into the market at today's Henry Hub prices. And they score well on every other factor. So how can you continue to poo-poo these kind of competitions, which is what a lot of our, our uh, senior managers continue to do. So I think that's good for that. They won't issue the U.S. has got the gamblers somehow. LG and GLNG for that stuff is a variable input cost. A variable cost of the input. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Because I mean, the Henry Hub prices change all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the ground to Japan. That's right. There is, yeah, there's a lot of... the cost of that model fuel depends on the input cost of the... Or the, the, the gas. Absolutely. I presume that's just the infrastructure you're talking about, so... Get some sort of infrastructure yeah, so it's basically a commodity and a capacity charge. Think of it that way in a pipeline. Yeah. So you pay the, commo the capacity charge to build the, pipe, the, the plant, yeah. and the co co commodity charge is whatever Henry Hub price to happens to be. So how do you consider the, do you, do you consider that as, as a, an investment on the infrastructure, in which case, yes, it's probably pretty certain it's yeah. going to be where it's going to be, yeah. Or do you consider it as a competitive molecule in, in Japan? Because the, Okay. Well, let me answer you this. Uh, you're absolutely right. And let me answer you this because what we tend to get ourselves in a bit of a, a comfort zone, we say, oh, you know, the price of the gas 
from coal seam methane in Australia is going to be known for the next 20 years. Because that feed gas is not a variable. I would argue it's very much a variable. It's so, so hard to predict what drilling costs are going to be in Australia a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And these projects have to drill hundreds of wells a year. So I don't know how anybody could say with a hand on their heart that we know exactly how much gas will cost in 2025 coming to Gladstone. And that's making this mass assumption that the res reservoir is going to be cooperative with you. That everywhere you drill the well, it's going to be exactly like the well you expected to drill. Well, that Santos has shown us in the last three years, that is completely a, a simplification. The reservoir is more complicated. These wells are getting more expensive all the time. They have to do all kinds of fancy gizmos on these wells to make them work better. Horizontal, laterals, this and that. You know, stuff they never expected to do. So that tells me that you actually have a variable input cost of, of gas. Now, I do think for CSM, for CSM, and I was just going to get into the fact that offshore or the WA project, it's a little bit different. I mean, that is a conventional gas field. I've been on the conventional gas field long enough, you know, especially in the Northwest Shelf and that whole area. So these wells are such high production wells. You let them go and pretty much, you know, exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, that, that variability is definitely gone. But I would argue that your labor is still a big issue. You still have a lot of other things to worry about, you know. You know, uh, do, can we really predict what Gorgon's upstream costs are going to be X years from now when there may be more stricter environmental regulations when, you know, the Barrow Island could be there? There is some variable, but you are absolutely right that the big uh, weakness the U.S. project has is they're totally exposed to U.S. Henry Hub prices. But every one of the others is totally exposed to oil prices. So how is that any different? You know? The buyer is happy to do that because they they will take a risk on LNG uh, on U.S. Henry Hub, but everywhere else they're taking a risk on oil because their contracts are all linked to oil. So selling, price. selling prices, yeah, you're not it's not the input price, but yeah, fair fair point. So uh, East Africa definitely scores high. The only thing it really scores low on is the fact it's remote, but there's no other real issues. Maybe some permitting issues, and the, can the Canadian projects don't score very good. And that's been really interesting for me because when I first did this thing, you know, everybody said Canada and North America in the same sentence. And Kitty Mad, I remember I was at Apache's offices in August last year in Houston, and the Apache uh, sales manager, she, very, very arrogant woman, I thought. But anyway, she just felt that her product was the best thing in the world. It's going to happen, and people are going to sign up for an oil link price, blah, blah, blah. Well, six months later, nothing's happened with Kitty Mad. You know, she, uh, EOG had to get out, Chevron's come in, they still haven't signed a deal yet, blah, 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 blah. Why? There's a lot of things going on, but one of the things that we forget is Canada requires a 500-kilometer pipeline, 600-kilometer pipeline. It requires all kinds of negotiations with the native folks to build this pipeline through. Canada labor prices are almost as bad as Australian labor prices are, you know? And where they're building the projects is quite remote. So, you know, I think that we can't just say North America, U.S. and Canada at the same time. I think there is a difference. And so Canada is more like an Australian project, while the American ones are, I think, quite different. And how do you define... The last year versus year two, like, is that purely on, on just the, where they where they kind of like where the groups okay, so kind of. I mean, in terms of materiality, you know, the highest lowest tier project versus the lowest tier two project, for example, is that a material difference or? No, I think that I think I'm trying to. What I, the reason I put them in tiers is to say I don't think we should get finicky about whether it's seventy two or seventy four, because my system is absolutely not that not robust. Yeah. But as a grouping. Tier one, top tier is better than tier two and top three. Yeah. So that's all you should be looking at. You know, it's like a five-star hotel. Some of them have pools and some of them yeah. don't have, well, they all have pools, I guess, but you know what I mean. It's a rough, <laughs> rough kind of a thing, so, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up here, but basically, I think it's a snapshot of a future project, allows users, especially any buyers, project company financiers, to really get a uniform to look at a project. I think it can be an internal tool. I think most companies have a tool like this. But again, there's that whole feeling about, you know, my project is better than everybody else's project. You know, there's a little bit of an internal bias. I'm sure that every time Shell does a project, or so I, they compare them with the competition, they have their own tools. First, they don't share these tools with everybody else. I understand that. But is there that internal bias? You know, we can keep our costs under control better than any other people can. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I think this is time to look at it from a very holistic point of view. If there is a weakness, I mean, there is a lot of places to improve. You can improve your government relations, you can improve your native native things, you can reduce your contractor risk by getting the right contractor, you can get reduce your buyer risk by getting the right buyer, 
you, as you get more engineering, your score improves because you go up down the engineering chain. As you get better marketing, your marketing score improves. So this is not at all static. It's meant to identify a weakness and say, okay, what do I need to work on and be recognized and recognize that it is a weakness. I think it's a leading indicator of project issues. Uh, so a couple questions. Should the government have played a more active role? Should the government have had a tool like this and said, okay, we have five projects being proposed in Gladstone. Which two are the best ones? Let's say those two go first. Let those two kind of get going, and then we'll approve the others. I don't think the government has, uh, can do that. It should have done that. I feel it should have done that. Played a bit more of an active role in all of this. Um, should the government continue to support all the parties equally? You know, they kind of has a broad brush. Oh, okay, the labor prices go up all around. Maybe they should be, well, let's, let's help rank these things. The use it or lose it policy, which in theory sounds good, which is basically, hey, you're sitting on these reserves for 40 years, you better do something with them. Has that encouraged a lot more projects to get proposed when they probably shouldn't, were not really ready to be proposed at the same time like everybody else? The timing of the use it or lose it strictness could not have been a worst because it happened at the same time there was this mass euphoria about doing other projects. Everything happened at the same time. Remember 2008, 2009 was like the Wild West here. You know, you couldn't walk down the street without running into an LNG project being proposed. Uh, in era resource constraints, should we look at all this? Should the energy company push the project? Should FID always mean the project investment should continue all the way to startup? I know the answer is, of course it will, don't be an idiot, of course no one ever pull the plug. I'm just thinking maybe we shouldn't be that. How long can Australian projects stay competitive? Can we un continue to underestimate these things? That language has changed. If you look at people like David Knox, but it's still quite dismissive. But a year ago, it was completely dismissive of any other threat. I think that's changed a little bit, but still, you know, it's really interesting to me. Look what's happened here. You know, BG is announcing going to reduce their stake in their project. Coal Gas is announcing going to reduce their stake in GLNG. Uh, GLNG is buying gas from everybody else. Uh, Conoco has said they want to reduce their stake. Why are they reducing their stake if it's so good? And no one should be reducing a stake in a project that you have already supposedly reduced the risk, right? The, they tell us all the risks are all the way to FID. After FID, the risks are now under control. That's what they tell us, right? Maybe I'm just being naive. Well, well if, they, if now we're post FID, why do they all want to reduce their share of the project? It's suspicious, isn't it? So I think that tells you that they are not so good. Uh, anyway, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, of course, and we have any questions. And um, Andrew said that we can have this, this presentation. I'm going to take the scores away, but I'll have the projects not identified in a presentation available for all of you at some point. Did I speak too fast? Did you all get it? <laughs> I'll ask a question. Um, what's, what's your view on the amount of LNG that could come back out of the US? I think it's enormous. I'm actually working on one of the projects right now. So, so, so they've, they've approved what? 40? Okay, so basically, you know, there's different approvals, and we get all mixed up with the approval. It's the DOE approval, FTA approval, and the FERC approval. So the, the only one project has reached the FERC approval side, but everybody tells me that it's just a matter of time, we're going to see this tidal wave of many more projects happening. In the U.S., it's very difficult for them to approve one and not approve others. And there, there's so much gas. Today, I was on a conference call this morning, literally this morning, uh, with a company in Minnesota, that's talking to me about all this flared gas in North Dakota. What are we going to do with it? So they're flaring gas in North Dakota now because it's too much gas for the U.S. market. And you would never imagine that a few years ago. So there is truly way too much gas in the U.S. It's very, it's, so many wells have now been shut in. I don't think it's going to make a massive impact on the U.S. prices. It's very, very much of a, a balancing thing. The more demand comes in, more wellheads come off, come online. Yes, prices, the prices are moderate. I mean, right now we're at 430 today. So you know, prices go up and down, but I still think the U.S. has this massive potential. Do you um, think the government there will, will preserve their energy? Their oh, I think the government there is doing all the right thing. I mean, it's, it's taking things slow. It's getting all these approvals and stuff like that, but I think the government has to be faced with the fact that there is really a lot of gas. It's not like hypothetical gas like it was in Australia. It's actually really, truly the gas, because they're producing the gas. So uh, I think it'll be a very much a price-driven thing. Whenever Henry Hub is cheap, you will have gas from the U.S. That's what all the buyers are buying an option. When Henry Hub is high, they won't buy the gas. And that's why it's a commodity capacity thing. So people are building the infrastructure to have that option. And you can build the infrastructure relatively cheap in the U.S. What's your sort of estimate of the pipeline that's actually going to be delivered out of the U.S.? Okay, so I mean, uh, you know, the numbers are you really, if you compare the U Australia, $3,000 a ton and above, 
in America, thousand, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred dollars a ton. So half the cost easily. Uh, that's just the capex to build this thing. And if you look at the math, I mean, basically at a four dollar price in the U.S., you can get it to Japan for ten, twelve dollars. Ten dollars is, is a low estimate. You know, at five dollars, you add up a dollar. It's pretty much a pass through cost. So you can probably go to seven dollars in the U.S. before thirteen dollar threshold gets hit in Asia, which is the threshold that. GLNG is shooting for today, and might actually be more than that down the road. Is there already reports that some of the parts have been experiencing some significant cost pressures? I think they, they are, but it's, again, I think what, having spent lots of time in the Gulf of Mexico, that whole Gulf Coast, is the cost pressure will not be like they are here. You know, stuff gets built, there's no shortage of skilled labor, all the contractors are there, environmental permits are relatively easy. None of the massive overruns, we, we won't have the blowouts we have here, because they're not looking at doing anything new. It's off-the-shelf stuff, and it's not at all remote. You can drive to Sabine Pass two hours from Houston, two hours from Baton Rouge, so, you know, I don't think the blowouts will be at all. It's just that the, the reason it's happening is because this is a really, the, I, and I graded them down, it's a very small company now trying to manage a massive capex expenditure, so that would be the issue. I mean, they're up to 16 a million tons right now, which is a lot for a little company. Scarborough, okay, so now Scarborough, I have not done because then I should do that. I think that uh, they'll get a lot of plus points. So obviously the company, you know, anything that Exxon does, I don't like Exxon, but I have a lot of respect for Exxon because they know how to do stuff, and I think that that's so. Uh, but having said that, I mean the scale that they want to build is really big, and the floating LNG, I think obviously Prelude rates high, so I think Scarborough will rate high as well. But there's more challenges with Pre Scarborough than there with Prelude. It's deeper water. I think there's more CO2. Uh, the scale they want to be is bigger, the ship is bigger, but I think it'll rate favorably compared to the CSM project still. Why did Sunrise fly to the school so much worse than Prelude? Uh, because of a couple of things. First, I rate them down on partner cooperation. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of dissension with the partnership, you know, about exactly how, you know, which way they go. I rate them down on government support because Timor Leste still has a, long, a big say in this whole thing. I rate them down on fiscal stability because we still the royalty rates are still all over the place. Uh, yeah, that's the three things that killed them. Okay, well, just still a dream, but I noticed they're well below on just upstream as well. And given that we didn't yes, I think that's part of it is because uh, the reservoir really is not as well defined as we think it is either. That's why you look at that. One of the reasons there's this ambiguity is because we don't know if the blob is in the 90% or the 30%. Everybody draws the blob differently because no one's drilled a well in Sunrise in many, many years. But the biggest score down is because early stage marketing also, Prelude is late stage marketing. Uh, Prelude is very far in engineering. Sunrise is much closer. And I think the, the partner dissension kills it. You know, too many cooks in the kitchen. So. Yeah, so those projects, who's um, associated with them throughout the community who would like it? Mr. Markman, for example. Say that again, please. For those projects, the LNG projects, who's associated with them throughout the community who would like it? Fisherman's Landing, exactly. Yeah, what do you think should be done, or what are they not doing right? Uh, I think that the, they should really look at why they're getting scored so badly, and they're getting scored badly on every front there is. I don't think people don't trust LNG Limited. Do we trust, do we trust LNG Limited? <laughs> He's not going to say anything. Uh, the reserves just are not there. They chose a contractor that was completely unknown. It was a subsidiary of the Chinese national company, but who's never built an LNG plant before. So. You know, their partnership structure is all messed up. They haven't done any sales. No one trusts them. You know, they're so far behind, you know. So what needs to be done? Well, all these things need to be fixed. They should they should they should get rid of their engineering contractor or some Chinese company and pick one that's done some stuff. I don't care where they're from. I don't know, you know, I'm not saying Chinese companies are bad, but they're picking someone that's never built an LNG project before. So if you want to establish credibility, you don't pick someone else who's as new as you are. You have no experience. You know, the guy who runs LNG United uh, Limited has just been all over the place for a long, long time. And uh, I don't want to get into specifics, but I just think there's, there's not that, I can't think of anything positive about the project. Is there Chinese money back there? Supposedly, yeah. But let's look at who the contractor is and why, how much, what is the Chinese money really doing? It's a lot of talk about Malopo stuff. It is all kind of, it's all very dubious to me. That's just my view. They've got a good location. Yeah, they have a location. They have a location. They have, they're the first guys with a location. That's why they have the name of the project, exactly. So they get, I think they get points of uh, government support. That's it, you know, or something. So. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not in this technical side. I am not 
familiar with that. When you say some companies here in Australia, they put very long contracts. By the time they reach to that level, the commodity price has moved far away from what they had seen at the original time. My background is finance. Don't they use the financial derivatives to safeguard that situation? Okay, that's a good question. First is that typically these long-term contracts are indexed to something, so they're not constant. Now, having said that, I have seen 20-year gas price contract, which is flat price, so that has been done. But most of the time, they index to oil, index to as energy, so they do somehow keep up with what's happening in the commodity world. Um, one of the reasons why the Japanese companies have traditionally gone with the oil price link is because there was a feeling that you can hedge that oil price link. Unfortunately, it's not so straightforward. You can hedge Brent. You can hedge uh, uh, WTI. You cannot hedge Japan crude cocktail, which is what it's based on, because Japan crude cocktail is a is an average of their weighted average uh, uh, oil prices that oil quantities that come into the Japan for the previous month, and that that changes all the time. So only people have tried to attempt to have a contract for WTI, but it's extremely difficult. Um, that's why I think my own feeling is that the oil price link doesn't work. It's been a false thing. And we should all, and, and not that we should, but Henry Hub is something that you can link to. It's not right either, because just because there's a tornado in, in, in Gulf of Mexico, why should Australia exports to Thailand change? You know, so we, there is no good, good, good system. But linking to oil, I don't think is a good system either. I don't think that's, but, they, but the feeling was when Japan first signed these contracts in the 70s, if we link it to oil, at least we can ensure there's always a discount to oil. Gas will always be cheaper than oil. So if oil prices go up, we can always tell our market, our consumers, they look at gas is cheaper, be happy with it. And that's true, that the contract forces that to always be a discount. But I always feel that that link may, may have made sense before. It doesn't make sense anymore. I think it's a losing battle trying to keep it. Well, they used to have the S-curve as well. But that was a they still have, most contracts have an S-curve. And that was just capping on the top and the bottom. But in the S-curve, it was just still a... You know, you're, it's, I always find this kind of a, a weird thing. On one hand, you're saying, let's have the free market kind of oil prices decide. On the other hand, I want to cap the bottom and the top. So it is a bit, you know, yeah, it served its purpose because that allowed the projects to get financed. Absolutely, it served its purpose. Is the today where we no longer require, I think, a long-term deal for a project to get off the ground, does it still have a purpose today? I don't know. When there's so many buyers, so many sellers, the LNG club has 70 people in it, it's no longer a buyer and a seller linking for life. That's all. I think there should be like any other commodity. You should have a, a, a hub-based pricing. So there should be a price in Singapore. There should be a price in Japan. And should every buyer, the ship shows up and people bid on the ship. And, you know, I think if you have a long-term deal, then you have the first rights on that ship. Maybe you get a discount to that hub all the time. But that hub decides supply and demand. Hmm. Why not? Every, all, every other commodity is that way. Of course, you know, people don't like it. But most other commodities don't have the enormous capital cost of building. Is that really true anymore? I, I, I question that. I mean, you know, I look at some of these giant iron ore projects and some of these kind of things, and, you know, uh, they're pretty high capex as well, you know. People in the U.S., I would argue that some of these new projects are not that huge capex. You know, they're starting off fairly small. They're modular. They keep on building more trains, you know. So you can, you can have a short-term contract of $5 billion capex. And get that off the ground. There, there's still a lot for the iron ore project. Yeah, yeah that's probably true. Sure. So. And you yeah. said you don't, you probably don't need long-term contracts to get financing. Right? I think that I, I think what I would uh, rephrase that I would say that look, long-term contracts we all would like them. They would like them, and I think it helps justify the product and justifies FID. But I think that you need long-term contracts with a certain degree of flexibility. I don't think long-term products are going away. But you can see that when times were, when the spot price was high, people were getting greedy and had less and less proportion long term and more left to the thing. And that may have backfired on some of the people. So, you know, we're losing that rigidity that you require 90% long term. More, I think there's a certain amount you want long term. You want more flexibility than the reopenings. Which yes. Which I don't think gives you enough. The other thing is long term contracts actually bring in the export credit and the That's exactly right. So that, that links it to, you know, that certain proportion is always going to Japan, and that helps you can get Japanese financing. And I'm, uh, I, think that's it. I think you need that long-term contract. But it's, I would hate to be in that situation of GLNG that I had to basically agree on a price of gas 20 years from now, though it's linked in oil, whatever, 
when I have no idea what my CapEx is next week. You know, it's really not, someone is taking a gamble. So you gamble, you, you hedge yourself by having a higher price and then it catches up with you and it's a difficult, difficult situation. Are you talking from a buyer's perspective or from a producer? From the seller's perspective. From the seller's perspective? Yeah, think of it. I mean, you know, it's like me saying, okay, you produce cars in Victoria. I want to buy a, a Ford Falcon in the year 2025. Give me a competitive price at that price, at that day. You don't know what your labor is going to do. You don't know what your energy is going to do. You don't know any of your input costs. And you're selling me a car today. We're writing a contract that I'm going to buy the car from you then. It's difficult. That's, that's like any project, though. You make long term assumptions and you can be right or wrong. Yes, you can make the assumptions, but then you hear you are, you're obliging the buyer and seller to a contract. Assumption is one thing, but now you're actually giving the guy the option. So in 2025, he's going to come to you and say, I want my car for you know the price you told me. And you could be right and you could be wrong. I mean, you know. And that's what I think is really kind of a risky thing to do when you have capex that are so undefined, especially in the cold sea methane projects. In the other pro LNG projects, I don't have a problem with that because your capex, ongoing capex, is so low. You spend ninety-five percent of your capex at before startup, and then only five percent over the next fifty years. That's great. Here, you got to build three hundred wells every year for the next twenty years. But, but when I sign that contract, one of my underlying assumptions is going to be that I'm retired well before. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and any shareholder that... And I'm going to get paid a bonus. Because I got a, a long-term deal. On the Absolutely. The and the shareholders, oh well. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, in your ratings, how, how, like, if we're looking at investors, looking at value in companies, etc. Are you from a bank? How, Sorry, I should ask you where you're from, you guys. A fund manager. A fund manager's good. Okay. <laughs> I, that's what I'm here to Isn't recommend. Right? I mean, you know, I think I'm an unbiased <coughs> view. I mean, this is, you, no, no, use no. mine or use something similar. So regardless of the price that we can pay for a sand dock in the, in the, on the market, if you rank it low, we can buy that sort of thing. You, you have to make a judgment call on every one of the things in your company's portfolio, right? That's why you recommend to buy the company or don't buy the company. I'm just saying that you should... It, you owe it to yourself to understand the underlying projects the company's invested in and don't just believe what the company's going to say. You know, look at how that project is going to be competitive or not. And that's what this aims to do. It has to be a neutral method to do that. It's not at all rocket science. You can reproduce yourself. It's not, uh, you know, it's not fail-proof at all. There's a lot of uh, subjectivity. I try not to have it, but there is subjectivity in this, and I know that. But it's better than what we have today, which is believe what they say. And while you got to think of the question, I'm going to plug one little thing. I just I, I make apps as well for fun, and I have a new app which is great. It's absolutely great. It's LNG projects. It's for the iPhone. It lists 85 projects around the world. But what is great about it, and I can say that, it's so every time things occur, you click on Aus uh, Australia, for instance, it gives you the list of projects. Uh, I actually don't have the next page. Oh, sorry, wrong wrong slide. It, it should be it actually gives you. Um, I sh I'll demonstrate you the project on my phone. It gives you the full facts of the project. It gives you my view of where the gas is going to go, the pipeline costs, et cetera, et cetera. And it's continuously updated because it links to my database. So every time I change, every time I hear the Woodside is canceled thing, you just got to give your iPhone and say fetch updates, and it, and it picks up the latest one. So three nine nine, you have all the LNG projects in the world. $3.99, how's that? <laughs> it's great. So thank you. So I'll plug Did you that have in. a game section on that? No, there's no game. <laughs> you, can't, you can't move faces around. And Mar super, super David Knox or something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'm here to ask questions. I hope that was useful. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, on behalf of everyone here, I'd just like to thank Vivette for coming down and presenting to us.